All right, hello everyone. Uh, it's great to see everyone here um, at our uh, CCUSA Cafe. Uh, my name is Vedanta Balbahadur. I'm a studio instructor and course lecturer at the McGill University Peter Fu School of Architecture and at the McGill University School of Continuing Studies. Uh, today's cafe is the third in a series of workshops uh, that have been held throughout the month of May centered on the theme of equity in architecture. As you may know, CAFE stands for Canadian Architecture Forums on Education. Uh, the first cafe this month dealt with equity in teaching and learning. And last week's cafe, uh, last Friday, focused on equity in research and practice. Uh, today's spotlight will be equity in service and engagement. Um, after this series of workshops, there will be an online and in-person event uh, from September 29th to October 1st, 2022, entitled Cafe Capital. Uh, which will be an open forum whose goal will be to synthesize, learn from, and build upon the key ideas from this month's uh, cafes. I'd like to begin uh, the day by acknowledging that McGill University is located on unceded Indigenous lands, which have long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst Indigenous peoples, including the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe nations. Uh, my specific location, commonly referred to as Montreal, is home to a diverse population of indigenous uh, and other peoples. We respect the continued connections with the past, present and future in our ongoing relationships with uh, indigenous and other peoples within our community. Uh, since we are gathering from uh, all across Canada, I encourage all in attendance to take a moment to acknowledge the stolen land upon which they gather and in considering the subject matter of today's CCUSA cafe, which is equity in architecture, to consider the long-standing effects of oppression and colonization evidence within architectural practice and academia. We, uh, when we conclude today's lesson uh, or session, I should say, let's resolve to think about the presented topics through this lens as we aim to build a better future. Thanks to everyone who's, who's here in the room. We really are so excited to get to talk with you um, and uh, go over these really, really interesting topics that our presenters have prepared for today. Um, so as mentioned, uh, today's focus is on outreach, service, uh, and engagement. And we are thrilled to have three presenters whose work aims to meaningfully deal with these aspects of academics and practice. And so I'd like to invite um, uh, Ra'ana, if you uh, uh, would like to um, share your screen and uh, begin your presentation. Great. Thank you so much for having me today, everybody. Um, so hello, my name is Rihanna. Um, my colonial last name is Brown, uh, but I go by Rihanna. You mean sometimes Rihanna Brown, whatever your jam is. Um, so I'm joining you today from Jojage, later colonized as Montreal, Quebec. Um, I'm currently pursuing my doctorate of art history at Concordia University, um, where I'm studying the intersection of Black art and activism as it emerged within uh, Nisquakama, later colonized as Sudbury, Ontario, as an active participant, as I I am um, the chair and one of the co-founders of Black Lives Matter Sudbury, as well um, as a current installation coordinator for Up Here Urban Arts Festival. So I'm super excited to be talking about this today because a lot of the work I do really is community-based, talking about the Black community and how we can kind of shift perspectives and the inclusivity within the realms of arts and architecture. Um, so as Vedanta said, I will be talking about decolonizing, dismantling, and demystifying design, the introduction of a Black feminist lens. Doesn't want to go to the next one. There we go. So I just want everyone to take a minute. And um, when I say the word architecture, when you read the word architecture, what are the first buildings that come to mind? Who are the first practitioners come to mind? And just give yourself a, a second to kind of think about what are the first things that you associate with the word architecture? We'll let it soak in. Um, so traditionally, in our academic institutions and as we become practitioners, a lot of the architecture that we become familiarized with is cis Euro patriarchal um, forms of architecture. So this means that we're learning predominantly about white men in the field. Oftentimes we're talking um, within an American context or a European context. We do talk within a Canadian context, but the commonalities are usually we're talking about white men in the field. 
And when we do talk about women in the field, they it's usually the tokenization of um, Zaha Hadid, everyone's go-to woman of color in the field. So um, I wanna talk about the key pieces of this exclusionary cycle that I've seen, I've experienced, and I'm hoping that together we can start talking about how we can dismantle, decolonize, and demystify this cycle to make a more inclusive field. So first, I mean, first it's a cycle, but um, for myself, the first thing was about learning. What do we learn about in the field of architecture? Who are we learning about? Um, what buildings are we learning about? And so for myself, a lot of it was, you know, talking about people like Frank Lloyd Wright, Le Corbusier, uh, Frank Gehry, Louis Sullivan, uh, Mies van der Rohe. You know, we're talking about these star architects. We're talking about these great white men. And that is very much how architecture was positioned. And it's very interesting because a lot of the education that we are being taught is not talking about women in the field. We're not talking about queer folk in the field. We're not talking about black people in the field. Um, so particularly today, I'm gonna to be focusing on, focusing on black women within the field as that is the group that I identify with. Um, but it's really important to start thinking about the nuances of what this means for ourselves when we start to become practitioners or if we become practitioners. Um, so very much in the institutions, you know, these men are put on pedestals and we don't talk about the other people that were there assisting their work. You know, when we talk about Le Corbusier, a lot of people don't know um, the atrocities that he did to Eileen Gray's house. And in fact, people actually praise him for what he did to her home. And if you're not familiar with what I'm talking about, I encourage you to read. Um, there's a lovely graphic novel about Eileen Gray's life that I would suggest reading. Or even Frank Lloyd Wright, you know, we don't talk about the ways he was predatory towards women or the ways that he ran his firms. We very much just put him on a pedestal and talk about how excellent these men were in design. So this then informs um, the practice that we do um, if we do become practitioners, which is another part that I will talk about, but it forms the kind of practice we do, the kind of design we want to do, which is very much still within this realm of what is considered good architecture, um, which I don't believe there is such a thing as good architecture. I think architecture is incredibly situational and it can ebb and flow depending on what we what we want it to do. So a lot of what we learn is, you know, how can we become outside of these boxes, but also how can we frame ourselves like Frank Lloyd Wright, Frank Gehry and all these other men. Um, and then that is a kind of practitioners that we end up becoming. And then within that practice, you start to see, you know, predominantly within the field, the largest population is white men. In um, the United States specifically, less than 1% of practicing architects are black women. And in Canada, we don't even have these statistics available because people aren't documenting them because people do not think that they are important when they're incredibly important because it speaks to the diversity. It speaks to um, people who go into the institution but don't make their way into um, actually practicing. So just to consider that. And then this in, for, in turn um, speaks to how we teach and how we mentor the next generation of designers. You know, So what we learned is obviously what we're gonna instill the guidance, the wisdom on the next generation, and it becomes a cyclical thing. So I go into the institution, I learn about white men in design, I embody my work with that, and then I mentor people to kind of embody that same thing. And then whether I teach or not, this is how the institution kind of continues in this cycle. Um, the great thing about this though, is because it's a cycle, there are so many points where we can kind of insert these possibilities for change. Um, and that's what I'm going to focus on today. So um, Camille Mitchell, who's a Black Canadian architect, she said, people wouldn't imagine a minority such as architects. Black women are very rare in architecture. And I think it is exposure of to the profession that is missing. Um, so this again speaks to the cycle and the ways in which you know people of color aren't encouraged to become designers, um, which comes from the institution, practitioners, media, a whole slew of issues. Um, so it's really important for us to take into consideration on how we can kind of remedy this. So um, Kimberly Crenshaw is a woman who coined the term intersectionality, which kind of speaks about the ways that we can look at the intersection relationships and identities of people. Um, she particularly defined it in relation to black women um, because black women were kind of falling through this margin where um, critical race theory and racial based issues were predominantly male focused and feminism was incredibly white women focused. So there was like no area for us to talk about black women. So, Although it was defined in particular to violence against black women, you know, Crenshaw talks about the ways in which we can apply this intersectional lens and this framework to other fields um, in order to diversify and create space for black women, but other marginalized individuals as well. So um, like I, I briefly talked about this, but you know, black feminism is centering the black 
women experience. And this is the idea that I want to bring forth to uh, this panel today is this idea that we can create space for other modes of thinking. You know, we don't have to just focus on the cis Eurocentric patriarchal ways of thinking, because a lot of that is very rooted in racism, in sexism, in white supremacy. Um, and so by diversifying the way that we think, by including a Black feminist lens, which creates space for Black women, but also when we look at Crenshaw, it makes space for other marginalized individuals, because it's really about just like considering everyone's nuanced identity and um, these layers within our personality. So this then starts to speak to, you know, disability justice, um, like I said, racism, sexism, uh, socioeconomic standing, all these sorts of things that we can kind of start to encompass and see how we can create space for diverse designers. So um, the journey to becoming a practitioner, obviously we know is not this simple, not this black and white, but I kind of just wanted to break it down, boil it down to, into its simplest form. So we, on one side, we have the institution and then we have this not so great area, which is kind of, you know, the six years of school, the exact exam, getting our hours, all that jazz. And then we have the workforce. But in this area, which I'm calling the not so great area, this is where we lose a lot of the potential practitioners. I mean, this is where I myself became lost in the system because we enter these institutions where there's no funding for people of color. And um, we need to take into consideration, um, you know, the ramifications of generational trauma, generational wealth gap, and the things for like, you know, a black student like myself coming into a field where I can't afford my tuition and the predominant funding is be given to white students who come from wealthy homes. So it's like, how can my, how can I as a black practitioner even attempt to achieve anything in the field if already I'm eons behind? Um, and then on top of that, like I talked about the curriculum, the programming, what are we learning? What are we studying? What are we analyzing? Who are we talking about? You know, that kind of thing. And, you know, very much in my experience coming from a space where, you know, we talk about Canadian art and architecture, and it was very much like, here are these white designers. We'll talk a little bit about indigenous designers. And that was it. You know, I didn't talk about black designers until my master's, which is already, you know, we're off on the wrong foot. It's like, where are the people who look like me in the field? How am I supposed to see myself as a practitioner if no one is talking about people like myself in the field who do exist, but just aren't getting the recognition? And then that's how we get into the space where a lot of students are falling through these margins and not wanting to become practitioners because where is the space for us in the field? And then again, this goes back to the, you know, the cycle that I was talking about where you lose the students and then the learning, the practice, the practice practitioner piece, and then the teaching and the mentorship piece. So it's really important that first we have the strong foundation in the institution where we're creating diverse space, where we're talking about these things. You know, we have to talk about how architecture affects um, segregation because there is a correlation. We have to talk about redlining because there is a correlation. We have to talk about misogyny because there is a correlation, particularly misogynoir, which is misogyny specifically against black women because there is a correlation. And so it's really important that if we don't talk about this in, in Institution, then we won't see it come, um, we won't see the fruits of its labor in the workforce. And we're just going to keep designing in the way that we do. And the architects are going to say these white men and the people of color, the black women are going to fall off the face of the field. So I wanted to talk a bit about some of my designs and the works that I've done in the past and kind of how I wanted to push out of the boundaries of this, but how it also informed that architecture is not always architecture, if that makes sense. You know, I'm sure in school we've talked about like Ray and Charles Eames, um, we've talked about Alvar Aalto and the boundaries that they push of what can be, what constitutes architecture. It's not always a building necessarily. Um, so this was my master's thesis, which was titled The Architectural Segregation of Chicago, Black Identity in the South Side. And in this, uh, project, I was looking at how, again, segregation was directly affected by architecture and how they used it as a way to force Black people, the impoverished class, um, into specific areas and how the community date kept who was allowed to live in the North Side. And then through this, I created this people-friendly architecture where people could lounge, where they could loiter, if you believe in the word loitering. I mean, loitering is kind of a racist terminology to discourage the gathering of Black people in community-based spaces, but anyways, um, you know, how we can create patina through graffiti, through spray painting, how we can create a space that is actually what the community needs, but not by speaking for the community, but by talking to the community. And, you know, we always talk about community engagement, but a lot of it is, you know, just seeing what the community wants, boiling it down to the bare minimum, and creating something, but I was trying to really create something that what is going to speak to the needs of the community. And then after I graduated, you know, I started to branch into these larger urban projects, you know, so this one is um, a BIPOC Lives Matter 
an EPDC called Ground Mural that I did in collaboration um, in Sudbury, Ontario with Black Lives Matter Sudbury and up here at Urban Arts Festival. And the idea was to talk about First and foremost, that these populations exist in our community. So we have the pride flag colors, we have the Black Lives Matter flag colors, the trans flag colors, uh, Pan African flag colors, and then we also had Indigenous educators on site who were helping us with these medicine wheels and giving us teaching as we were doing it because it's great to in theor to theorize about these practitioners, but it's important to actually bring them on board. You know, I couldn't have done this project if queer folk weren't on the ground, if Indigenous folk weren't on the ground, if Black folk weren't on the ground. So it's important that we don't just speak about how can we solve these issues arbitrarily but how can we include these people to make a more inclusive space? And then finally into the matrix unearthing black futures, which is another project where we kind of talked about Afrofuturists and this idea that they're black people in future because you know sci-fi traditionally looks from a white perspective as well. Um, less architectural based, we ended up doing massive projections, but more art space. And again, it just to help us kind of think about the ways in which we can kind of use architecture and our architectural knowledge as a means to diversify the ways in which we uh, work as practitioners. So I only had 10 minutes, so I really tried to condense everything. Um, but the takeaways from this are, you know, first and foremost, it's important to decolonize our institutions and our workforce. This means um, diverse grants. This means diverse curriculums. We can't have a course on what we now call Canada art and architecture being solely centered around white practitioners. We can't have courses about BIPOC teachings being taught by white faculty. We can't. We need programming surrounding things for Black individuals, for queer individuals, for Indigenous individuals held by them, but in a space that makes them feel safe, that makes them feel not tokenized. We need to dismantle, dismantle the current systems that we have in place. Um, so take away this cis gender eurocentric patriarchal lens that is in front of us that has been imbued into us because of the cycle that i was talking about and really break it down and rebuild the system in a space where black women like myself feel like we can become practitioners and where we want to and then really demystify what is architecture because i think a lot of the times we talk about it in a way where it's you know architecture is this big thing that we can't really tap into and so it's philosophical and not everyone can participate but how can we make it accessible architecture should be accessible because who is inhabiting the building the people who is viewing the buildings the people who has to live with these buildings the people so how can we demystify it in a space where people can understand that architecture is for them it is designed for them and it should be and it needs to be um and i think architects like um france Francis Carré is a great example of this, the way in which he brings together his community to participate in the actual building and understanding and development of these buildings. So decolonize, dismantle, demystify. Um, so I hope I'm not too much over time, um, but thank you all for joining and I hope you'll pop into the breakout room and we can have a really incredible discourse. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, um, Rana. That's really, really a, a lovely presentation. I kind of didn't want it to end. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it was really um, sort of, um, it, it drew it draws attention, I think, hopefully for all of our participants today, um, for all of the audience members to, to areas where things that we can address in our own sort of outlook, but also in, in, our, in our schools and in practice. Um, things that, uh, opportunities we can seek uh, with engaging and, and, uh, um, and sort of being open to engagement in ways that uh, that that those sort of the things that you talked about about being in school and there have been a certain lens and focus on things in the you know past ten to fifty years um, and longer uh, sort of don't uh, touch on that kind of engagement and and I think it's so wonderful that you've you've highlighted these things and I look forward to the discussion that we'll get to have um, with the with the audience in the breakout room. So I'd like now to introduce um, Chris, Chris Beju. Chris will be speaking, his topic is um, volunteerism, homelessness, architecture, practice slash education. And uh, the floor is yours. And we uh, were eager to hear uh, your presentation. Okay, so yeah, that, uh, my name is Chris Beju. I'm uh, presenting from Sudbury, Ontario. Uh, I'm currently working as an intern architect uh, here in Sudbury also teaching part-time at the McEwen School of Architecture as a first-year design studio uh, professor. And yeah, I'll be talking a bit about my experiences uh, with volunteerism and how architects can engage with homelessness through service, engagement, and outreach. Kind of discussing the topics of how architects can appropriately 
and in a beneficial way address the issue and the topic of homelessness. Uh, to start, I'm gonna lay a bit of some groundwork. So to me, when I'm talking about homelessness, there's been discussions about terminology recently of comparing the term uh, homeless with unhoused, with housing excluded. And when I'm saying the term homeless, uh, I'm thinking of a broader definition than just a lack of a physical shelter. So to me, in my academic research and in my thesis, I found that there are often three dimensions that make up an individual's home. There's a physical dimension, a legal dimension, and a social dimension. And that housing and being unhoused exists in a spectrum, not a black and white uh, scenario. So that there are, so there's a spectrum of housing exclusion, of homelessness, and you can exist you can exist in homelessness. Homelessness is a topic broader than just being unhoused. And so for me, I'll be using the term homelessness uh, and referring to people as individuals experiencing homelessness, not people who are just merely unhoused. And so from this uh, basic definition, what I wanna state is that this is how homelessness is defined, but I really do believe that homelessness should be rare, it should be brief, and it should be non-reoccurring. And that as architects, we have a potential to address homelessness and to meet these three physical needs, not just to eliminate homelessness, but to make it less reoccurring, to make it more rare and to make it much briefer for people who do experience it. As well, uh, I will state that although housing is always part of the solution, it will never not be part of the exclusion, I do believe that housing alone is not the solution to homelessness. So how then and where then from can architects address homelessness? So an architect's obligation. As architects and as professionals in architecture, I believe we work in a service industry. We are working to meet a client's needs through design, to provide buildings, to design the built environment, uh, to provide installation services, and that the best way to give that service is through building relationships with the people you are designing for. And oftentimes in professional practice, it's quite easy. A client comes into your office, they hire you, you meet with them. In school, we're trained how to meet a design brief, how to understand what a set out expectations are and how to meet those expectations. But we often aren't equipped with is how to engage with diverse communities communities like people experiencing homelessness, like people who are using substances, like people who are experiencing trauma, like people who are experiencing racism. And oftentimes we don't have the tools to engage with these communities, but I believe the first tool is building relationships. And so for me, I see volunteerism as service or in my, in my personal experience in my undergraduate degree, I used volunteerism and service to build those relationships with these diverse communities. And specifically in my instance, the community of people who are unhoused and experiencing homelessness. So this was my view about one morning every week, sometimes to uh, throughout my entire architectural education, six years volunteering at the soup kitchen, serving breakfast, scrubbing the stoves, cleaning the kitchen, setting up tables, tearing down tables, talking with people, having conversations, building relationships, uh, getting to know people's stories, making observations. And for me, volunteerism was really my way of participating and engaging with the community of Sudbury that I was new to. So it was my way of becoming an active member in my community. And so looking at service, for me, as I was learning about architecture and in my undergraduate, service really became an inciting moment for me where academic research met anecdotal firsthand experiences. So where I'm learning about topics in school, I'm then a member of a community building relationships with people that I might be learning about when discussing housing, when discussing designing for those who are unhoused. And so for me, I think service is really an investment in community that can lead to meaningful and productive engagement. So 
when we ask the question, how can we have ethical engagement as architects, as educators, my answer from my experience is that service is the foundation for engagement. And really what I mean is that relationships are the foundation of engagement. Transactional engagement comes from building relationships and service really is a great spot to instigate that relationship and to build it. And so now I'll share a few projects from my undergraduate degree, as well as my uh, master's thesis, where my experience volunteering led to design projects uh, in the various studios I took at the McEwen School of Architecture. So this project here was an example where engagement came through conversation. We went, we've traveled to Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario, and spent a few days there doing a comprehensive urban analysis. Uh, we were studying the topic of urban design, and a part of my site analysis was to go visit the local soup kitchen and to see what issues that member of the community are dealing with. And that, that conversation I started to have with the volunteers there, with the people there, led me to the question of how can design destigmatize essential services like providing a meal, providing a warm place to sit, providing shelter. And so from that, I was able to turn that design project into a development that brought together people under a shared roof that decentralized meal provision through a community kitchen that could provide uh, for-profit meals and, uh, and uh, municipally funded meals for people within the same shared space and that that shared space might allow for degrees of social inter engagement and interactions that could also start to deconstruct the social dimension of homelessness, the isolation, the lack of relationships, the stigmas, the prejudice against uh, the, the broad understanding of those who are homeless. Another project in my undergraduate degree was an independent study. Uh, this came directly from observations I made while volunteering. So as I was volunteering at the Samaritan Center, I would often notice that the warm dining hall would be empty and that most of the individuals we were serving would spend all their time outside the building against the street, in the rain, in the snow, with no shelter. But that's where they chose to socialize because that's where they were allowed to smoke. That's where they were allowed to meet their friends who were maybe banned from being indoors. And yet the building on its outside was a flat blank facade with nowhere to sit and people were often asked to cross the street to stay away from the public entrance due to smoking bylaws and issues, which basically left people sitting in the cold, in the open uh, most of the time. And it's being perpetrated by a service provider that's meant to be providing shelter, providing meals, providing comfort. And so this observation led to conversations I had with individuals who were going outside, saying, why are you going outside? Why are you spending your time out there? What would help? And the first thing that they told me or showed me was they needed, they wanted a place to sit. They wanted a place to express themselves and they wanted a place to participate in either production or collaboration or community events. And so I was able to design a bench that could provide private and communal seating areas a community garden space on the property adjacent to the Samaritan Center and an installation over an electrical box that could be used as a graffiti wall for people to express themselves uh, in front of the service providers. And this design exercise was not only a relationship between myself and the people I was working for, but it actually started a conversation with the service provider with the city who was responsible for the planning approval for the plaza across the street and with the property owners, uh, which in Sudbury is uh, a rail yard across the street, so that's CN Rail. This design project was able to bring all these four groups together to a table to discuss about each other's needs, each other's services, and that this was not only an engagement between myself and, and, it, and one community, it was an engagement that brought communities together around a shared comment, and it all came from a single observation. Finally, I'm gonna share some uh, examples from my thesis. This is an example where uh, engagement was brought forward from the built environment. 
uh, a lot of what I wanted to do with my thesis was consolidate the projects that I had been doing in throughout my undergrad, discussing topics of stigmatization, of social services, of dignity, of the role of people who are homeless in the built environment, and how that acts as their living space and thinking about what is the messages that our built environment are giving to the people that rely on those spaces as social infrastructure, as living spaces. And so these observations led me to engage with hostile architecture in our city through observation and through mapping. And these mapping led, led to the observation of hotspots in the city and realizing that th these elements of hostile architecture were really traces of conflict that they were centered around areas where there was the most conflict. For example, the transit terminal, which is right next to mental health services, which is right next to a methadone clinic, which is also right next to a Tim Hortons, also right next to an LCBO, also right next to other offices and shops, where all of these competing communities are crammed into a tight space without any clearly defined boundaries. And that this hostile mixing creates conflict and the result of that conflict is the deconstruction of public space rather than considering the construction of public space to diffuse conflict, it, the city chose to go with dismantling because of course they did. So my way of engaging with this topic was to engage with it through design build. So at the beginning of my thesis, I decided to take on a research creation exercise where I designed a parasitic architecture that was built from hostile elements to build communal and to build destigmatized and shared spaces around common needs, like the need to sit down and the need to drink coffee in the morning and all throughout the day. So on the left uh, is an example of a coffee stall I set up where I served coffee for a day. Again, using my experience volunteering, serving coffee, having conversations, knowing that that breaks down barriers and builds relationships. I wanted to see what would happen if instead of installing hostile architecture in a space, I installed a communal device. And then on the right, the example of building a bench where a fence was erected to keep people off of a property and to segregate people within a property, but then using that fence to build a creative space. And I built these devices and I actually took them out and engaged with people through participation. So for me, it wasn't just about theorizing. It wasn't just about academic research. It wasn't just about narrative research. It was about actually building and actually having the people who participate in these spaces participate in my research. And this was my way of getting live feedback on my hypothesis and really testing it out and engaging with the community, which then led to design implications, which I implemented in a final building in my thesis, which I, of course, don't have time to go all the way through, but it was a great opportunity. There was a really positive benefit. Everyone, uh, including people who identified as homeless, including people who actually worked in the buildings that had installed the hostile architecture, everyone came around and were able to share in conversations around inclusiveness in the city and the deconstruction of public space in our downtown. One of the areas I found most difficult, though, was engagement through uh, was engagement in an academic environment. So when we talk about engagement with complex communities, like people who've experienced trauma, like people who are experiencing homelessness or who are using substances, there are so many, for good reason, but there are so many cautions around ethics approvals and around avoiding implementing more harm as a researcher. And I found that as an architect alone with a 12 month deadline to write a thesis, to come up with a thesis, I just didn't have the bandwidth or the time to go through a whole ethics approval that it was really, it got in the way of my ability to engage with people with lived experience who have the most to say and should have the most to say and who should be at the center of engagement. And so instead I was able to engage with them through interdisciplinary collaboration. So our University of Laurentian has a strong social work program, which has a poverty and homeless advocacy group who spend, who go through the ethics approvals and spend a lot of time interviewing people in our city, doing point in time counts. And thankfully I was able to collaborate with research assistants and researchers in that group to go over past already approved interviews and to do a post kind of a post interview analysis 
thinking of how people felt about the built environment, how they felt comfortable, what they were looking for in a building or in a home or in housing or in life to help address the social dimension and the physical dimension and the legal dimensions of homelessness. And thankfully, through interdisciplinary collaboration, I was able to access these perspectives, but it wasn't easy. So finally, if service begins relationships, I find engagement builds community through relationships. So engagement builds relationships in the way that service is a great starting point. And as a foundation, engagement is what I find really builds those relationships, builds relationships of trust, of communication. And that to me is the key to engagement being transactionary and to not being harmful. And that when that engagement is a transaction, when there's mutual respect, you can engage with these diverse communities in a way that isn't negative. And so finally, I wanna talk about outreach and understanding outreach from the ground up. What I found in my experience was that service-led engagement really, really actually led to outreach naturally. So the relationships that I found eliminated the need for kind of top-down outreach where you might do an outreach event to be able to engage with people who are experiencing homelessness. Instead, those relationships were pre-existing. And so outreach wasn't required to initiate those relationships. And that initiation happened through service. So instead, I framed outreach as a way of disseminating information, thinking of design as a outcome of a relationship, of an engagement, and thinking of outreach as a way of disseminating that, the product of that relationship, and of giving a voice to the people you're working with, and of highlighting voices, of bringing people to the table. So for example, my conversation that I had in Sault Ste. Marie with service providers led to a presentation to the city council of Sault Ste. Marie about how they can redesign and rebrand their social services to be more, less stigmatized, to be more branded in a urban and positive way, not in an institutional way. Uh, the example, like I shared of the Plaza Community Garden and Bench brought the voices of people with lived experience to the table with the city, with the municipality, with service providers to have input on the spaces that would be provided for them. And uh, my thesis, for example, was shared uh, with the city of Toronto and with the Mayor John Tory to help them and to be able to meet with them and in their affordable housing strategy to meet with them on one of their projects and to advise them in how they can better incorporate lived experience into the design process of affordable housing. Uh, the project to St. Marie was also brought on by the owner of the building we were working on. Uh, in Sudbury, Lynch University, I was brought on to do a report when they're having issues on the property with, uh, during the pandemic with people vandalizing the building, with people abusing the kind of public spaces and how to not militarize public space, but how to modify to be more inclusive. And also meeting with the city of Sudbury, I've given presentations to their uh, community services committee, to the Sudbury BIA and to the city's council and mayor about how our downtown and built environment can be more inclusive and how inclusive design can benefit not only the city, but also the people who we wanna include in the city, the broader community. And all of these were ways that I was able to bring perspectives that might not be heard to the table that came from relationships where I'm not just sharing about my own work, but I'm sharing about the collaboration and how that collaboration took place. So finally, what I see I developed in the end was a cycle where service led to engagement and that engagement led to outreach and that outreach allowed for more service to happen. And at the center of that was lived experience, that it was relationships that connected service to, to engagement and to outreach. And that I really do believe when working with communities like people experiencing homelessness, having that lived experience at the center is always so important and is key to how as schools, as professionals, as educators, we should be framing conversations about providing a service thinking of how you can build relationships first and how design can come from those relationships, be instigated by those relationships. 
So finally, I've been asking myself these questions as I've moved into professional practice and teaching. What is the potential of service engagement cycles to address complex topics like homelessness? So I found that architects need to be equipped to engage with diverse communities. We are going to design for these communities. Our designs will impact these communities and to not consider them is to do a disservice and to do a harm. And that's often where we have examples of septed being turned into hostile architecture. And so to bring these voices to the table by having pre-established relationships through service and engagement is one of the potentials that we can help address these uh, topics in these communities. How can we implement service and engagement cycles into an academic environment? Uh, this past year when I was teaching at the McEwen School of Architecture, I helped found, a, or I founded a student group dedicated to giving students opportunities to volunteer in the downtown community. It was the McEwen Downtown Community Involvement Committee. And the idea was that students who are living in our downtown often want to be able to help and reach out but don't have don't have a a connection to to service providers that they won't want to engage with so it's about providing the opportunity for people to start relationships and to start projects that might come from volunteering and finally the question that i end with is how can we integrate service engagement cycles into professional practice? As educators, we are training architects to become professionals. We're also training people to become designers. Not every person who goes through an architectural education becomes an architect, but everyone who works in design, who works with clients in a service, needs to know how to engage with these other, with these diverse communities. And so for me, in my professional practice now, we've taken on a few affordable housing projects, a municipal RFP for transitional housing and a nonprofit affordable housing project. And what I've brought to the table is bringing service providers and outreach workers into the design room in schematic design and using those relationships to then have them bring people with lived experience to the table. And we're having them give input on our design we're incorporating a requirement for participatory design in our RFP proposal to the city, saying you need to bring lived experience to the table. We're working with social enterprise constructors, builders who hire people experiencing homelessness and leverage construction projects as training opportunities and as meaningful employment. We're not only implementing those in affordable housing projects, but I'm now bringing them into our other professional projects, our practice projects, and making community engagement and involvement a real part of the practice that I'm a part of. To, to conclude, I wanna ask the question of how educators can equip architects or professionals to go out into the world and engage with the people they're designing for. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christopher. Um, this was a really, really lovely presentation. And I wanna just say, um, you, you, you touch on such great points. I won't say much now because we're going to go into Clara's presentation, but I will just quickly say one of the things you said, there's so many things that maybe architectural education, equip, it, it equips us for so many things, and there's many things that it doesn't equip us for yet. And you hit the nail on the head about one of them, one of the aspects that, that has been lacking in over, not maybe not, not in specific institutions, but as a general uh, sort of system of things. And the fact that you took the, the bull by the horns, you know, and tried to create that type of service engagement, that really, um, it, it's, it's, it's architects like you and, and students like you who are going to push this forward. And I, I really just um, thank you so much for, for your presentation. Um, Clara, Yes. I'd like to shift over to you now and um, uh, thank you so much for being with us. All right, so I'll just get started. So hi everyone, um, welcome to my presentation. Um, my name is Claire James and I am a recent graduate of the undergraduate program at the Daniels Faculty of Architecture, Landscape and Design at U of T. Um, I'm also the founder and president of Black Students and Black Stills with Nini and Aiden. Um, and when I can find a time, I'm also a freelance graphic designer. Um, okay, so now that we've sort of gotten all the formalities out of the way, uh, who am I really? So, oh, 
wrong slide. <laughs> so I grew up on the beautiful island of Bermuda in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. And yes, like the Bermuda Triangle, because I get that a lot. Um, but Bermuda has been so much more than a mysterious island. Um, but it has also been such a place of inspiration for me in terms of its culture, color, and community. And it's definitely influenced the way I experience the world. And as a designer, it has always been my goal to implement all of these elements in everything I do with community at the center. Oh. Uh, so how did I get here? In, so in the first two years of uh, being at Daniels, I was a pretty quiet student and I didn't really question much of the curriculum and the courses that I was taking. Um, but in my third year, I made it a point to explore some of the other courses that U of T had to offer, um, one of which was geographies of urban, is, urban social exclusion and segregation, uh, where we studied uh, the great book, Spatializing Blackness, Architectures of Confinement and Black Masculinity, Masculinity in Chicago by Rashad Shabazz. And this elective course uh, completely changed uh, my perspective on the impact of architecture and uh, urban space on racialized communities. And this is when I began to question um, architecture and design um, and how that directly impacted me as a Black woman. And if I'm going to be completely honest, it wasn't the most comfortable experience navigating architecture school as a Black woman. There were some moments where I felt out of place and the lack of, rep lack of representation wasn't encouraging either. But I did have a glimmer of hope when I met my mentor and esteemed place maker, Jay Pitter, who you see here, um, who has truly helped me and inspired me to keep going regardless of the systemic boundaries that I might face along the way. And networking with Jay and other Black professionals not only opened the door to so many amazing opportunities, but it also helped me to build confidence and have more awareness of what goes on in the industry. So why am I here? Um, taking a closer look at the pedagogy, I came to realize that there wasn't only a lack of Black perspectives within placemaking, but it also seemed like no one was doing anything about it or had made any efforts to uh, make change and progress, progress in architecture. Um, there was uh, one lecture that really highlighted and solidified this for me. And it was in my third, final and third uh, semester of my undergrad graduate degree um, and we had a class that brought uh, in design professionals to speak on their experiences outside of academia. And most of these speakers were white men, but one week we did have a woman of color um, and speak about her experience. And that's when my close friend gave me the courage to ask the question, uh, do you have any advice for women of color in the field of architecture and how do you navigate that space um, that is usually occupied by white men? But unfortunately, her answer not only reinforced uh, this gap in gender and race within the industry, but it also made me realize uh, that there's not enough support for Black and racialized women within and beyond academia. And so I had to do something about it. Um, so this is where BSD all began. So in the summer of uh, 2020, just after George Floyd had been brutally murdered um, and the Black Lives Matter movement was at the center of attention, I took the opportunity to be part of the immediate and actionable solutions. I uh, first became the Summer Student Equity Commissioner, working very closely with the faculty to again address um, and create solutions for anti-Black racism within the architecture and at the Daniels faculty. And I also helped host town halls and Zoom meetings with the faculty and student unions. Um, but I knew the systemic change wouldn't take would take a lot of time, but I really wanted to make a difference immediately. So that's how when I created Black Students in Design. Um, I wanted to create a space for Black students at the Daniels faculty to feel like they had a community and also feel like they were able to express themselves creatively. It started with me reaching out to a few Black students and that I had just seen around school and asking them if they were interested in joining me to create this crew. And then from there, we all connected online where we hosted bi-weekly Zoom calls where we were able to become friends, engage in online activities like movie nights and sip and paint, and really continue the conversation around anti-Black racism in academia. 
Through Black Students in Design, I, I found an immediate action-based approach to dismantling at anti-Black racism within architecture from the ground up. But all of this would not be possible without my amazing team. Um, so we have Renee Powell Hines, who is the VP and co-graphic designer, Rhea Flash, who is the events coordinator, Tommy Van Bigarde, who is the events coordinator as well, and then Vienna Holdit, who is the social media coordinator. And I cannot forget um, the amazing uh, admin uh, outreach team, Nini and Aiden, for really pushing us to do amazing things in the coming years, in the past years that um, I'll be talking about shortly. So what did we accomplish? So like I said earlier, we hosted lots of social events for the students to really build the community and come together and just enjoy company with each other. Um, we also moderated various important conversations on blackness in architecture as part of the Daniels Faculty Public Programming. We also connected with Beta, which is the Black Architects and Interior Design Association, as well as the BPUA, which is the Black Planners and Urbanists Association, and other Black uh, professionals while providing networking events for our Black students um, uh, through our annual careers in design event. We also are Definitely active on social media and Instagram, uh, showcasing a lot of our students' work and really helping to uh, build the community. And of course, our biggest success is our mentorship program, Building Black Success Through Design. So Building Black Success Through Design is a multi-level mentorship program where Black Daniels University students uh, support Black high school students who have a passion for architecture and design. BBSD creates pathways to post-secondary education in architecture and fields and design fields, including the Daniels faculty's liberal arts programs, nurturing equity, diversity, inclusion, design excellence, and critical awareness supported by the 2021 Access Programming University Fund at the University of Toronto, uh, we were able to launch a 10-week pilot program um, created by Black students in design with the support of the Daniels faculty. And our first cohort of seven high school students from across Canada created final projects for a design competition. These outstanding designs, achievements, Design achievements and emerging talents of these participants were celebrated at the BBSD showcase uh, where their designs, design submissions were reviewed and received by awards by our esteemed panel of jurors. The impact of our program is summarized by one of the participants uh, sharing that as a Black LGBTQ youth meeting all the kinds, all kinds of Black students and design professionals was incredibly enlightening and uplifting. So that was really encouraging to get that kind of feedback on just the first pilot program. And so for BBSD's future, we hope to expand uh, the program um, and apply for another round of the APUF funding. And this expansion of the program will not only increase the size of the mentorship program in terms of the amount of students we bring in, um, but also will aim to uplift the current students within our faculty. Um, and this will include leadership training um, and professional development for our mentors and Black students, um, as well as uh, portfolio reviews, design charrettes, and hopefully networking events in the coming year. And so the aspiration of the program is to inspire Daniel students to pursue excellence and innovation within the within design industries and academia, enhancing diversity within the faculty and therefore building black success through design. So what did I learn from all of this? So I think the biggest takeaway is that you can make immediate action, you can make immediate action based solutions just by doing it and reaching out to whoever is around you. You really don't need to wait for the systemic change to make a difference or to feel like things are evolving. Um, really take advantage, especially if you're in school, take advantage of the teachers, uh, the admin people who are in your school um, and ask them and 
ask them about your idea and see if you can, you know, start something new and you can do the same thing that I did, or maybe not in a different way. Um, but definitely try to build your network from the inside out. And you'll be really surprised to, to see what you can accomplish. Um, so thank you so much. That was it. Nice and short and sweet. But I also just wanted to say, um, because we are still growing, we would definitely like to collaborate with other schools. So please feel free to reach out to us and I will see you in the breakout rooms. Thank you so much, Clara. That was really great um, to not only learn about the, the work you're doing, but about even just that when, when you were concluding, you, you mentioned a really great point about we don't have to wait for systemic change to take action and to be supportive. And, and in some ways, that's how the systemic change will happen, really. Uh, thank you so much. Um, thank you to Clara, Chris, and Ra'ana. Um, it was really great to hear from you, and we look forward to hearing from you shortly in the breakout rooms. Destiny, um, who is a, a doctoral a candidate at McGill, proposed a great question to um, Ra'ana in breakout room one. And Ra'ana, you were just finishing. I know you were almost maybe wrapping up, but I still don't wrap up. Like, can you finish the thought you were saying? And then we'll go to the other rooms and let them do that. Yeah, so Destiny just asked like this really excellent question of like um, essentially making space for ourselves as Black practitioners and Black students in the space and kind of how do we, um, I don't want to say protect ourselves, but like how do we like unpack it all and deal with it all in the institution, especially as often the only Black student in space and, you know, the traumatic experiences that we face on the day to day. Um, so I basically was talking about, you know, being in a class and professor saying we're going to talk about Blackness this week and then every white student loves to center themselves and all of a sudden well I read this one Black book and I read this and it was like very difficult for me and then the next week we, um, I basically was talking about we we're supposed to be talking about indigeneity white people were talking about it again and somehow they started talking about a virtual reality experience where you could um, experience the final moments of Trayvon Martin's life if you don't know the story of Trayvon Martin. I'm not going to rehash it again. Um, but I was talking about how triggering and traumatizing it was. And I was lucky to have a colleague in the space who was Black. And we were able to talk about it and get other people on board to writing a letter to the professor based about why that was problematic, why that class was like traumatizing and triggering. I mean, but like after that, I kind of shut down for the semester. I didn't participate. I didn't want to be in course. I didn't turn on my camera because we were still in Zoom. And it was like, it's very difficult to, you know, find your agency and your voice as a student to be able to speak out. Um, but I basically was saying that, you know, as faculty members, as a lot of us here are faculty, it's important to check first of all as yourselves and then tell your students to check themselves. The amount of times I've been in a course and students were disrespecting the course content because no one is checking themselves. First and foremost, we're all privileged to be here. We have an architectural education. We have this background, whether, however we've paid for, you know, I'm still struggling with immense student debt, but I'm privileged to be in this space and I need to check that. My socioeconomic situation, right? We all are privileged in some way. And if we can't speak about that, then we, we are not in a space to be in this space to participate. And then also encouraging your students to check themselves. You know, I remember being in an indigenous studies course and students came out mad because the professor basically said, you can't do indigenous architecture because you're not indigenous. And people, all the white kids came out be like, bah, 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 because they don't know how to hear no. They don't know here. No, this is not a space for you. No, this is not for you. And everyone was livid and no one, no one was checking themselves of their privilege or their position. So it's really important that we have to cultivate these, I say safer, because a safe space does not exist unless I am by myself, um, but safer spaces where we can start to have these conversations and normalize these discourses and these conversations about what is going on. Because, you know, the amount of times I've been in a space where people are talking about, you know, Le Corbusier and how great he is. And I was like, as a woman, I feel offended that people are teaching about him because he did horrible things to Eileen Gray. And I feel offended when people are citing Frank Lloyd Wright as the be all end all as a woman. And not to mention as a black person, how I feel when they're like, architecture is this great field. When we talk, talk about Paul Revere Williams and the discrimination and racism that he faced um, as the first black architect. You know, so it's really important that we, you know, check ourselves and our biases and we really have to start to unlearn what we have learned. And that is part of, you know, the cycle that I'm talking about that the institution posits us in a certain way where we're like, this is how we have to talk about academia. This is how we have to teach. And I found like this is why I was really struggling in my degrees, because things were very much like, you have to learn this way, you have to produce this way, you have to do this. And I was like, I don't learn like that. This is a, you know, a colonial perspective. This is a European perspective. So congratulations to all the students who are succeeding. But like, as a Black disenfranchised student, 
I'm not going to thrive in this space. This isn't a space for me. So it's really important to like look at, I know it's so much to consider, but it's like, it's important to take this all into consideration and really create a space where people can participate and how can we shift the paradigm of these conversations, um, if that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rana. The hardest thing I think, at least in, in my experience about getting into all of these rooms, right? Like we work quite hard. Um, you know, my background's also math and physics. So I've been in the science. So I've, like I said, I've been in, in all white spaces my whole life. So I'm not really, I, I have no, I guess I'm not, I, I don't think that things aren't going to happen the way that they tend to do for, for my, for myself and for lots of people who, who have similar experiences. Um, I think the hardest thing is, is thinking that, you know, people are saying certain things or acting a certain way um, because of my, you know, inabilities or, you know, because I've done something wrong, right? So a lot of the times I experienced with professors, you know, um, they, they'd be really harsh on some of my work. You know, there, there's, mm. you know, understand a certain level of critique that's constructive, that, you know, they're trying to get your work to improve. And then there are things that are, are you know, things that they just would, wouldn't say to other students. And that was really hard. I'd, you know, I'd go to some of my classmates, my peers, and I'd say, like, you know, the professor's kind of saying these weird things and, and they don't want me to act this way. And, you know, they're not really saying this to anybody else in their critiques. Did you hear this? Did they say this to you? And they're like, no. And that was a really hard thing to not feel like I'm making things up or, you know, it was because of myself or, or things like that. Um, and then I think too, it's really hard to, um, I, I just, I really think people don't understand the difficulty of being alone, right? Like, I think that, you know, when you see people at these positions and, you know, doing PhDs, doing, you know, being a professor, all those types of things, th there's this weird prestige that people assert onto you that makes them think that you don't have any difficulty, like you're past racism, you're past sexism, you're at this like level. And, you know, there's this weird <laughs> level of prestige and accreditation that protects you from all of those things. And mm -hmm. I would say it's gotten worse. I would say the, the smaller rooms I've been in, the more difficult things people are saying for me to, to try to process. Um, I read a paper in a class and somebody said, well, this whole paper sounds super angry. Like her, the tone of this author is angry. And the paper was about racism and, and it, ironically about cyber racism and the way technology, you know, has been designed in, in, in ways that are also problematic. And it was interesting. We spent the entirety of 40 minutes talking about the voice of the author, as opposed to the points or the credibility of their research or anything else um, about the author. But we just talked about how angry her tone was because the author was not dancing around um, the issues in, in the, that they were addressing. Um, so, you know, there are those types of things. And then, like I said, the conversations are getting more frequent, but not more comfortable for myself or even my classmates. So I think that um, it's quite kind of difficult. Um, so I guess really, you know, when you see something or you hear something, or, you know, you're thinking about the way you're teaching, um, think about the person who it's most difficult for in the room. Um, and that sometimes that's not you, right? Which is really hard. And also, I mean, yeah, a great book came out this past year about um, Black professors and students in academia in Canada, which is super great because we don't have a lot of those. And I had an opportunity to read it and it was just so, so incredible to, to read my own experiences on paper and how many of those things I've had to witness, but also to hear that somebody else has gone through those things, even if they're not in the same room. So it's, it, it's important to share these stories because, you know, they somehow trickle down to somebody else and that encourages them that they're not, you know, crazy or, you know, super unqualified. Um, yeah, I'll put I'll put the name of the of that book in the chat. I just saw a question um, for everybody to read. Yeah, that's a great recommendation. But yeah, I guess those are kind of all my thoughts on the question I asked. Thank you for answering, also, Rana. Yes, and thank you for sharing that, Destiny. I think you brought up a lot of great points about what it's like to be a student and face that type of feedback and criticism when it's totally. So we continued the discussion to learn more about Chris's work. Yes. And in that discussion, uh, Justin, who was in the room, made a great suggestion that to include service and engagement as part of the accreditation work, but also as part of the licensing procedure to become an architect. So at least 40 hours uh, so that we learn how to, to do it mm. and how big of a change that could be. So I think it was a... a an amazing um, outcome of the discussion today that we learned from Chris's work. Uh, 
and the and the discussion room. Yes, the internship policy. I, I asked the question about the presence of women in homelessness situations, and uh, Chris actually was saying how uh, women are you don't see them on these extreme situations, more on the other ones that are kind of hidden situations of homelessness. Uh, so also the difficulty of women to engage into helping with those mm. extreme situations. And he, he could maybe wrap up and say a few words about it. Thinking of how kind of diverse people can engage with a diverse community. And that's where I think the role of interdisciplinary collaboration is so important that as architects, we don't necessarily have the training to provide healthcare or outreach services at all times. Mm -hmm. or to organize and run certain events and that we should be equipped or able to engage with the professionals who do have the training to then facilitate those relationships. So to be able to have engagement in a way that's safe for everyone who's interested in it by working with nurse practitioners, by working with trained professional service providers, and that it really is important for us to kind of step down from the driver's seat as the architect and to let other people guide that interaction and that engagement who are maybe better suited or have a better perspective or better training for that. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, that's, I think, how I see the way that people from different backgrounds or different, different levels of comfort, maybe, of engagement are able to engage in a way that's best suited like, for them. So much work is being done on this subject matter by very few people, mm -hmm. right? And... I want to hear from Clara and Raanna about strategies they've chosen or developed in saying no and yes, because so much work is being placed on your shoulders all the time. Whether you like it or not, you enter a room and everyone wants your feedback immediately, um, and including this room. And mm -hmm. I, I really need to hear from you. And I think everyone needs to hear from you how, how hard that is, because it's like you're constantly on and how you're picking those moments for your own mental health and how, you know, yeah, I'll stop there. Yeah, uh, thank you for saying that. Um, I think for me, I'm still learning how to say yes and no. So far, it's always been yes. And I just jump on every opportunity and experience um, that is presented to me, but I am learning after, you know, two years of doing this work that it's so important to take a break and to, you know, sort of remove myself um, from these spaces sometimes because it does get intense and because I am so extremely passionate about making a difference. Um, I get so emotionally involved that, you know, when these difficult conversations happen, it is hard. It's not, it's not an easy thing to uh, go through. Um, but I think having supports from, you know, the Daniels uh, Faculty Outreach Office and Mimi, it's really helped me to like guide me in the right direction and remind me to take breaks and not, you know, overextend myself when, you know, participating in the change. And my goal is to really hopefully build up more students so it's not just me or not just Rihanna, um, you know, doing this kind of work. So, um, yeah. That was great. And if I can add something, I just say, I definitely been there where everyone's like, do you want to speak to da, 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 da? and everyone wants to hear your opinion also, especially after 2020, let's be real. 2020, everyone wanted to be a black person's friend. Everyone wanted to hear a black person speak and hear our insights about things we've been saying for a long time. And I think I'm finally getting to the point where I say no to things. I'm usually one, I mean, this might sound conceited. I don't do anything for free anymore, unless it's for a black communities. If it is for a black community, if it's for like, a black student who was where I was, or if it's for a black person, I will do it. For, but if like an institution or someone asked me to do something for free, I will say no, because I know what my expertise is worth. I know what my time is worth. Um, and very much people love to do the thing where they're like, oh, um, it'll be great exposure. It'll be great for your resume, blah, 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 blah. You, exposure doesn't pay the bills. Exposure, mm -hmm. you know, it's one of those things where it's like, pay black people what they're owed we people love to circumvent this thing and be like oh well we'll give you this that and the other thing it's like no pay them for their time this is um it's one of those things where you're being consulted for your expertise and the, you also have that added fact of the trauma that is associated with it you know i don't love rehashing every day all the things that i've gone through within the academic sphere so it's like 
compensate mm -hmm. for that. And it's also a matter of who is asking you to do it, you know, along the way of my journey, I'm nowhere near the end. There's been a lot of people who question whether what I'm saying is true, who vilify me or, um, you know, like Destiny's talking who say, well, that sounds angry. And I'm like, well, I am angry. Like, and I should sound angry. And why aren't you angry? And that kind of thing. And it's like, I very much, I'm like, I'm not burning bridges. The bridge has been burnt. The bridge was not built. So it's very much being careful of who you say yes to, you know, I'm like, if an institution has treated me poorly, I'm not going to go back. And I very much also look to the people who were assisting me along the way. If they asked me to do something, I'm going to go into it with much more care and compassion than someone I don't know. And you very much look at like, why do they want you to speak? And it's, it's so difficult because you're very much in this position where you have to question everyone's intention, which I don't want to be in that space, but it's like, someone asked me to speak and I'm like, okay, is it going to make them look good? Where are they going to put it? What's it going to be? Are they going to hide what I'm saying? And especially in if I'm through the work I do with Black Lives Matter, people love to do that. They love to ask me to come in and do interviews and then try to spin it and make me kind of trip up on my words or mm. frame things in a certain way. You know, I mean, I was asked to do an interview a while ago about like a Black History Month initiative. And the interviewer had the audacity to try to spin what I was saying and get commentary on the convoy that was happening. And I was like, one, no comment. Two, this is not the space. Three, and then he had the audacity to like laugh at me, mispronounce my name. And it was just like, okay, I won't be speaking to you again. Or if I am, you know, you just have these tactics of what you're going in for. And it's really hard, but we always have to go in with like these walls up and like be our guard up to be very careful of these spaces that we're putting ourselves into because you don't know what it's going to be used for or how it's going to be you know, received, like even coming into this space, I was really nervous. I was like, what if I come here and I have a bunch of people who are like, what the heck is this black girl talking about? And no one wants to hear what I have to say. And they don't like the harsh realities. And it's, I find like the older I get, I'm definitely getting more confident in being able to be like, no, I experienced racism. I experienced sexism. It happened. And I'm going to talk about it and tell you how to, I'm not how to avoid it. Like, I'm not going to write like a book on how to avoid racism in the institution, but like, I'm going to talk about it and note that like people aren't going to like it and that's okay. Maybe they're not ready to hear it. Maybe they're not ready to learn it. Um, but finding these spaces where you're, where you're valued is really, really important. You know, a space where I'm like, I'm not tokenized because I'm black. Like, yes, I'm a black scholar, but I'm not only a black scholar. I'm so much more than that. And I think it's like really important to start to uncover that and like really find that agency that we have we are so powerful we are so powerful we can dismantle this whole system and we are change makers and it's really important to recognize that these immense abilities that we have and I'm going on and on because I'm so excited about this but <laughs> no that was a great question Tammy. <laughs> Rihanna and Clara we're very happy that you said yes <laughs> to this invitation so thank you I'll just touch on two points that came up in room three and one is with Clara the the point that she raised that there was an elective taken, which was transformative. And that elective was outside of the architecture school. And finding out about that elective and, and um, enrolling in it was a challenge. And I think there's a lot more we could be doing in architecture schools to make uh, electives transparent and open to students. And then also with Nini, the question of support, you know, what exactly does support look like? What exactly does service look like from that part of academia, which supports students? What does that entail and what, what transformations are, are underway there? Yeah, so it was uh, very tricky, as Lisa was saying, uh, for me to even just enroll in a different course outside of the architecture uh, 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 field. But once I was able to do that, um, I was so amazed by the different uh, ways that these other courses were making the correlations between architecture and social segregation. But I had not seen that. And that was in my third year <laughs> in my undergraduate program. So the first year we didn't talk about this, the second year we didn't talk about this, but not until the third year outside of the program where I was able to you know, enlighten myself about you know, uh, blackness and architecture architecture um, and what the effects were. And so I think there's a couple things that need to change. It's definitely awareness of, you know, how the university runs and how to apply for different kinds of uh, courses, what what kinds of courses are offered outside of architecture or even within the architecture program that, you know, are not supported or not given enough, you know, energy as some of the other courses. Um, and then also, Speaking to your point of uh, support, I think it has been uh, amazing having Nini, uh, uh, you know, 
provide me with the support I needed to do BSD and also do Black students in design, I mean, building Black success through design. But I think what has made it successful is that she has given me the resources, helped me with, you know, technical things, but she's given me the space to make decisions about if I want to be an official U of T club, which is a whole nother thing, because there's so many bureaucratic restrictions that can prevent you, for, prevent me even as an alumni doing this kind of work, right? Um, but also just allowing me to, me and my team as well, to uh, make the decisions for the Black, for us and for ourselves, instead of imposing ideas on us and telling us to do specific things. And I think to me, that's what support is, is to give to give me a thumbs up, keep going, and also helping me along the way, whether it's with presentations or even organizing a script or, you know, helping me, you know, with the literal material things to produce these kinds of programs, like connecting us with that wh where's the space going to be for the showcase? How, how many, where's, how, how much is it going to cost to print things? And mm. that kind of thing is so important. And Nini did a fantastic job. Um, and she's still doing an amazing job uh, supporting BSD and Black Students in Design. Well, thank you so much, um, Nini, for expanding on that. I, I think it's, it's, it's a great, I think what you and Clara have just also said about, I really love the world, word scaffolding. I think, you know, enabling and giving the resources is, is just so important. And it's sometimes it's in sometimes I remember as a student, it was like that with me. Well, with and, and I think it's like this with many students in, at McGill and other places where there's sometimes they're just expected to figure things out and that and where to go and how to get the resources they need. And that is something that ha really has to change. And it's something that we can all work toward. And if I just, um, you know, the first uh, Part of the conversation that Anna and, and Destiny were having when we came into the room here, I think that was in a way a great summary of what we talked about in room one, in breakout room one. Um, I'd also just add to that a couple of things where um, just as a little conclusion to breakout room one, one of the things learned was that I really appreciated was that at a certain point, you know, Anna was working uh, on her thesis and then said, wait, something's not feeling right here about what I'm exploring. It needs to be made right. And then she had the support, she had the key people, and, and the, they, they gave that, that sort of scaffolding around her to allow her to feel comfortable to pursue that. And um, I, I don't know if there's anything else about that, Rana, that you'd like to, to touch on. We also talked about um, just sort of, uh, Tammy brought it up very beautifully about, and this has been the through, through line through all of the breakout rooms about being, are being sensitive to lived realities. And that, um, as you said it yourself, Rihanna, about checking ourselves and checking, and the students checking themselves to realize, let, let's not come with, with this, be those people who were leaving the room feeling the wrong kind of mad because they can't do a thing that is not theirs to do in the first place. So um, anyway, I just wanted to come back to you, Rihanna, to see if you had any sort of thoughts or summarizing ideas from the conversation is including about the courage it takes at a certain point in a project to flip the script. Yeah, I think it really speaks to this idea of these like um, institutional box that we are placed inside, you know, the output that we have to have, everything is like checking this box, everything is like you have to fit within this realm, but it's really important to be like, I mean, as much as I like preach about like diversification, inclusivity, intersectionality, and like, I mean, rebelling against the cis Euro patriarchy, it's important that like, to not replicate these same systems that we are, um, that we're facing. And I found that's what I was doing with my thesis. I was like, this is what it should be. And this is what it's going to be. And I was like, trying to fit my program into this box that it wasn't working into. And I was like, I just realized I was like, wow, the brand, that's really colonialized. You know, I mean, I've grown up in a colonial community. That's is what it is. And I was like, oh, well, I can just kind of do anything. And I think that's really important. As silly as it sounds, I'm like, the sky is legitimately the limit, not even the sky, space and beyond. Like there's so many things we can do with it, with architecture. If you think about it, everything at its foundation is architecture, like literally everything we are architecturally made. And so it's really important to embody that in the practice that we are doing and know that like, 
when we go to school and they're like, you have to do this building or you're in the field and they're like, do this condo. And they're very much like doing this. We can break these bounds. We are the next generation. We are the current generation of practitioners, of teachers, of mentors, and we can flip the script. It's really up to us to kind of shift the paradigm of what is and isn't architect. Like, you know what I mean? The sky's the limit and it's up to us to define what can and cannot be architecture and design. So. I think that's a great way to conclude. <laughs> um, uh, the day of, of discussion um, and uh, the workshop. Um, I would like just to remind everyone that um, the workshop has been on equity and service and engagement, but in September, September 29th to October 1st, 2022, there will be the concluding forum that's entitled Cafe Capital, which will take place at Carleton University um, at the Israeli School, and um, where the sort of ideas that have been uh, communicated, thought about, reflected upon today and between now and then will then be built upon um, for the uh, conclusion um, for that particular forum. I would like to uh, introduce and thank today's uh, CAFE coordination team for their work in making this workshop possible. Um, I'll just mention them very quickly. Uh, Kai Woodma, who is from Laurentian University, uh, Nini Brody from the Daniels Faculty, uh, University of Toronto. Uh, Vincent Hui uh, from Toronto Metropolitan University. Uh, Diogo Bernay from Dalhousie University. Uh, Lisa Landrum from University of Manitoba. And the three um, uh, students she has working with her in kind of chronicling today's meeting, uh, those would include uh, Alina Bolinoshko, Cole Marota, and Temi uh, Akin Shiku. Um, a special thanks to Ozer Saluji, who did much of the initial coordination for today's cafe, as well as to Anne Bordelot, um, and all those who co coordinated the previous cafes. So thanks everyone for being here. I wish you all a great weekend, and uh, we'll see you uh, hopefully soon and maybe in September.